This video is brought to you by Squarespace, the tool to use to make a website for your brands and grow your business. More about them in a bit. Way out on the fringes of the solar system lies a world like no other. Triton is the largest moon of Neptune, the great ice giant orbiting 4.5 billion kilometers from the sun. A distance so far, our own star appears a mere glowing dot. Out here, temperatures fall to ungodly levels, so low that they hover only a couple of dozen degrees above absolute zero. Yet, despite this, Neptune's greatest moon isn't just an inert ball of ice. Rather, uh, we've known since 1989 that Triton is geologically and spectacularly active. On the surface, great geysers erupt, shooting vapor eight kilometers into the air. Up in the atmosphere, clouds of nitrogen scud through faint and hazy skies below a highly charged ionosphere. But it's below the surface that the greatest prize may lie, underneath a layer of ice. It's down here that scientists suspect Triton harbors something that should be impossible. A layer of ocean, one that possibly harbors life. In today's episode, Geographics is expanding our space series with a visit to one of the strangest moons in our solar system. A moon that could upend everything we think we know about our cosmic neighborhood. Ask most casual space fans to list our solar system's greatest moons, and there are some names you're guaranteed to hear. Names like those giants Titan and Ganymede. Names like those of the confirmed water worlds like Europa or Enceladus, or perhaps that of fiery Io. But there is one natural satellite that flies under most people's radars, a moon that we visited only a single time over 30 years ago that nonetheless still tantalizes us with its mysteries. The name of that moon is Triton, and it may just be the most fascinating place that most people have never heard of. The largest of Neptune's 14 satellites, Triton is also the seventh largest moon in the solar system, with a diameter of 2,700 kilometers. To put that in perspective, that's bigger than fan favorite Pluto. But it's only when placed in the context of the Neptunian system that you can appreciate how big Triton is. While Jupiter and Saturn both have multiple large, fascinating moons, Triton absolutely dominates its siblings. Seriously, the second largest Neptunian satellite, Proteus, has a diameter of only 420 kilometers, barely a fraction of its mighty neighbor. As a result, it's calculated that Triton alone contains over 95% of all mass orbiting planet A, a veritable boulder in a region of upstart pedals. And that size means that Triton behaves far less like a simple moon and more like an alien world. Orbiting its host at a distance of 354,760 kilometers, Triton both supports a thin atmosphere and experiences something like Earth's seasons. Of course, these seasons are only Earth-like in a general sense, sort of like how Garfield and Shere Khan are both recognizably feline, but one inspires fear while the other inspires only thoughts of lasagna. Still, the basic ingredients are there. As each season comes and goes, the conditions on Triton's surface change. In the bleak midwinter, that means the atmosphere freezing and falling to the ground as nitrogen snow. In the summer, it means evaporation as that snow once again turns to gas and rises up. It also means wild temperature changes. When in the depths of winter, Triton's surface can plunge to an abysmal minus 240 degrees Celsius. That's so cold it ranks among the coldest places in the solar system. But while such seasons might be Earth-like, the sheer length of them is utterly alien. In 2010, the Very Large Telescope confirmed that a single season on Triton lasts a full 40 Earth years. That means we've never witnessed the Southern Hemisphere in anything but good weather. It was springtime when Voyager 2 flew past in 1989, while it's still summer today. Once again, though, the concept of good weather here is entirely relative. At such a vast distance from the sun, Triton's surface receives 900 times less sunlight than we get on Earth. Because it's mostly covered in nitrogen frost, even the sunlight that does arrive mostly reflects back into space. Which brings us neatly to our first great mystery the hyperactive ionosphere. Here on Earth, our ionosphere is an incredibly active place, full of charged particles. But it's like this because of the massive amounts of solar radiation constantly bombarding it from our nearby star. Triton, by contrast, is so remote that its ionosphere shouldn't have anything like the levels of activity that we've observed, meaning there must be some hidden energy source. Nor do the above-ground mysteries end there. There's also the role played by volcanism. Right now, there are spectacularly few places in our solar system known to 
have active volcanoes. Earth has them, Jupiter's moon, Io has them in spades, Venus might have them, and then there are a few places like Europa which possibly have them at the bottom of a subsurface ocean. Triton, by contrast, has confirmed volcanism, the likely source of nitrogen in its thin, hazy atmosphere. This means uh, we've been able to observe some cool things, like the formation of nitrogen clouds three kilometers above the surface. But it's the implications that are really interesting. If Triton has volcanism, that means it's geologically active, a living world completely unlike the dusty wasteland that is our own moon. Already, oh, we've seen evidence of this etched across its unusual surface. When Voyager 2 flew by the Neptunian satellite in 1989, it sent back images of a surface that was remarkably young by the standards of the solar system, possibly a mere 10 million years old. Instead of the countless impact craters you'd expect, there were smooth plains shining with nitrogen snow, fields of frozen volcanoes, ridges formed by outpourings of icy lava. Stunned scientists compared it to the skin of a cantaloupe. And that could only mean one thing, a surface endlessly being reshaped by geological activity. But what might be causing this? What might be the mechanism by which a moon in the chilliest corners of the solar system comes to life? The answer lies in another of Triton's oddities, its bizarre orbit. Let me just interrupt this video quickly to tell you about one of our longtime sponsors, Squarespace. Now you've heard me talk about Squarespace before, and honestly, if you're making a website anywhere else in 2022, well, that just seems like a bit of a mistake, because Squarespace have all the tools you could ever need in one convenient place. And not only that, but that place is super easy to navigate and make a website on. All you got to do is go over to Squarespace. From there, the next step for those who want to be quick is to choose one of their beautiful templates. They make finding the one for you super easy. They ask you questions about what your site should be for, and you're like, cool great, it's about this, it's about that, it's going to be like this, and then they're like, here are some templates you will like, it's very easy, and then you customize it, no worries. There's lots of other features you can use once you're set up, for example, you can pop a little email form on your site, so potential customers or fans of your blog, whatever it might be about, can reach out to you. And of course, they've got all the basics like analytics and blogging tools. There really isn't a better place to build a website. Go to squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash geographics to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain. And now back to today's video. Were you to fly a spacecraft out to Triton and stand on its surface, the sight that greeted you would be spectacular. Up in the sky, the vast blue orb of Neptune would dominate your vision, its edges rendered fuzzy by the haze of nitrogen. In the distance, liquid plumes would spray from below the surface, carrying material over eight kilometers into the sky. But it wouldn't be until you got down and examined the ground that you were stood on that things got really interesting. The colorful ice under your feet would turn out to be a fascinating mix of elements. Over half comprised of frozen nitrogen with maybe a third water ice, the rest is frozen carbon dioxide. Since you're the sort of super scientist capable of building a craft to fly you out to Triton, that mix would strike you as familiar. Not because it resembles Earth, but because it resembles the combination of elements found on the surface of Pluto. And that makes a hell of a lot of sense, because scientists think there's no way Triton formed with Neptune in the same way that most moons form alongside their hosts. Instead, they think it started life billions of years ago as a dwarf planet in the Kuiper belts before being captured by Neptune's gravity. The most direct evidence that we have for this is Triton's unusual orbit. Neptune turns counterclockwise on its axis, which means that its moons should all orbit around it in the same direction. Triton, though, breaks the rule. Instead, it orbits in the opposite direction to Neptune's spin, something that's known as a retrograde orbit. Now, this isn't unheard of in our solar system. Some of Jupiter's outer moons do the same, as do some minor moons on Saturn. But the retrograde Jovian and Saturnian satellites are all tiny and significant things. No other major moon of significant size acts like Triton, which means its history must have been utterly unique. The current theory goes that the moon formed in the Kuiper belt alongside objects like Pluto and Eris, probably as part of a binary system with another world alongside it. At some point in the dim and distant past, those two worlds found themselves in a collision course with Neptune, but thanks to some highly complex orbital mechanics we don't pretend to understand, they didn't actually crash. Instead, the force of their near hit tore the two siblings away from one another. Triton's sister was hurled out into the solar 
solar system sent spinning off into the eternal darkness between the stars. Triton, meanwhile, was ensnared into a highly inclined orbit, doomed to forever circle the eighth planet, cut off from its lost sibling like a cursed character in a fairy tale. Well, we say forever, but that's not actually the case. With its current orbit, Triton is doomed to eventually get pulled too close to Neptune. At that point, gravitational forces will shred it to pieces, destroying it as completely as a direct hit would have done all those billions of years ago. Eventually, those fragments should coalesce into a new ring around Neptune, a permanent memorial to the annihilated world. It's a fascinating story, one that explains Triton's odd orbit, its similarities to Pluto, and even why Neptune's moon, Nerid, has its own weird orbit. It's thought the disruption caused by Triton's capture sent it spinning onto a weird new course. That means that in the many parallel universes where the capture never happens, Neptune doesn't have a significant moon at all, and Pluto is just one of two fascinating dwarf planets that we've been studying for decades. But that's not the universe we live in. In this universe, Triton was discovered far in advance of Pluto, just days after the discovery of Neptune itself in autumn of 1846. That October, news of the newly identified eighth planet was everywhere. Among those to see it was John Herschel. Now, John Herschel is important because he was the son of this channel's favorite astronomer William Herschel, better known as the first man to gaze admiringly upon Uranus. <laughs> That meant John knew a whole bunch of astronomers in Britain. On hearing of Neptune's discovery, he wrote to one of them, William Lassell, being all like, did you hear about that new planet thing? You know, maybe go check it out. Maybe it's got a moon. Who knows? Go on. To which Lassell must have been like, oh, sure thing, old bean. By Jove, look, I've just discovered Triton. What, what? The discovery came a mere 17 days after Neptune itself was found. Although, our uh, made up quote aside, Lassell didn't actually get to name the moon. Instead, that honor fell to a Frenchman, Camille Flammarion, who spent ages trying to find a suitably aquatic name for a moon paired with a planet called Neptune. After presumably discarding easy options like Sailor Moon, Flammarion instead named it after the Sun of Poseidon. Weirdly, it would turn out to be the perfect choice. Many, many years later, Voyager 2 was going to discover that Triton's relation to the ocean went beyond just mythological names and extended all the way to a possible hidden sea. At the height of springtime, something strange happens in the polar dune fields of Mars. As sunlight warms the surface, deposits of buried carbon dioxide ice start to evaporate. As the ice turns to gas, it builds up enough pressure to come shooting out in a geyser of CO2. We've known about these Martian plumes for several years now. For a long time, it was thought they were only the second such jets in the solar system caused by sunlight. That's because Voyager 2 had captured images of great geysers erupting from the surface of Triton, blasting nitrogen high into the sky. Aside from two caught directly on camera, evidence for 120 more was seen in the form of dark streaks on the surface. The leading hypothesis was that these were caused in the same way as the plumes on Mars by buried winter ice sublimating in the spring sunlight. Fast forward to today, though, and scientists are no longer sure, because we've seen evidence of similar plumes erupting from Saturn's moon Enceladus and Jupiter's moon Europa. In both cases, the jets aren't thought to be caused by ice deposits. Rather, they're evidence of subsurface oceans, traces of hidden seas spraying into space. And that raises an interesting question. What if Triton has a hidden ocean too? And this question is important since, as regular viewers of our astrographic subgenre will know, where you find water on Earth, you'll normally find life. Which is why NASA is now spending billions of dollars to examine water worlds like Europa in the hopes of uncovering hard evidence that we are not alone, that microbes or even complex organisms may have evolved elsewhere in the universe. Maybe even way out in the frozen reaches of Neptune's orbit. Now, we need to stress that all this is purely theoretical at the moment. While Europa and Enceladus have confirmed subsurface seas, the existence of one on Triton is purely speculative. That being said, there are good reasons for assuming that it might be there. The first being that constantly changing surface. For Triton's surface to be so young, it needs a constant churn of activity. Activity that could be due to movement of rocks or possibly due to a hidden global ocean. The ocean would explain the cantaloupe skin that the moon has because such weird ridges could easily be caused by chunks of ice rising in the waters below to push up against the brittle surface. The second good reason for believing in this secret water world are the plumes themselves. 
If we discount the sunlight warming hidden ice theory, there are only two possibilities left to explain the geysers. Some form of geological heating that melts pockets of nitrogen ice, or the existence of cryovolcanoes, ice volcanoes, fed by an invisible sea. Since we've already seen such plumes on confirmed ocean worlds, it stands to reason that it could be the latter. If there really is an ocean under Triton's surface, though, it raises an intriguing question. How? How does it remain liquid so far from the sun? And the answer is thought to lie in Triton's peculiar orbit. As you'll remember from our Europa video, Jupiter's moon is in resonance with two of its siblings, Io and Ganymede. This means that every orbit Europa gets tugged by their gravity. This causes friction, which in turn creates a heat source that could keep an ocean liquid. The trouble with Triton is that there are no companion moons big enough to tug at it. So instead, it has to rely on the biggest gravity source of all, Neptune. Now, we mentioned earlier that Triton's orbit is strange because it's retrograde, but it's also inclined, meaning that the moon dips above and below Neptune's equator line as it goes whizzing around. As a result, Neptune's gravity exerts a pull on different parts of the planet at different times. This causes a friction effect, leading to heating. Not much, but potentially enough to keep a salty ocean buried under a layer of ice from freezing solid. If that's the case, then those plumes Voyager saw aren't just weird natural effects. They're postcards. Postcards from the depths of a lightless ocean, carrying traces of the chemical stews swirling around down there. Potentially even carrying traces of the microbes that might make this ocean their home. That means that a potential Triton mission would have a wealth of data to study just lying on the moon's surface. And if we were to find biosignatures in the traces of a plume, it might upend our understanding of the entire cosmos. Not so long ago, the search for exoplanets was a desperate hunt for rocky worlds lying in the so-called Goldilocks zone, the band of habitability close enough to a star to support life. In recent years, though, we've started to realize that there are other Goldilocks zones, zones like the subsurface oceans of moons orbiting in resonance around a gas giant like Jupiter. If we could also add to that list moons orbiting ice giants at the very edges of their solar systems, well, that would mean the entire universe might well be teeming with life. Sadly for those hoping we might soon fly a craft to Triton to check, a doom to disappointment. Right now, there are no NASA missions planned to the Neptunian system. But that doesn't mean scientists haven't been thinking about how to pull off such a mission, should NASA one day change their minds. And the proposals they've come up with are awe-inspiring. If you were to summarize the NASA Discovery Program, a good way of doing so might be with the phrase cheap but spectacular. With a budget capped at a mere fraction of the cost of flagship missions, Discovery projects are meant to show off the agency at its best, doing remarkable things for pennies. Past successes include placing the first rover on Mars, launching the Kepler telescope that discovered over 2,000 exoplanets, and the Dawn mission to underrated dwarf planet series. In other words, it could have also included an upcoming mission to Triton, one with an appropriately warm watery name, Trident. Shortlisted for the Discovery Program in 2020, alongside the Io Volcano Explorer and two Venus missions named Da Vinci and Veritas, Trident was ultimately passed over in favor of the Venus probes. Nonetheless, it left behind a useful blueprint for what a future cheap mission to Triton might want to achieve. And it starts with hunting for evidence of that theorized ocean. We mentioned earlier that Europa's subsurface ocean has been confirmed by NASA. Well, the agency did that by measuring the moon's magnetic field and discovering discrepancies only a global layer of salty water could be causing. So, the big plan for Triton was to do the same thing with Triton, to figure out once and for all if liquid water exists there, perhaps ahead of some future mission that might sample the plumes. And yeah, that's future mission. One way Trident was kept so cheap was by making sure it would only perform flybys of Triton rather than do anything cool like go into orbit or land and take samples. But then, maybe that's appropriate for a place that we know so little about. A low-cost mission that could have potentially uncovered a good reason for spending more to go back at a later date. Not that ocean seeking was all that Trident was designed to do. At the moment, our only encounter with Triton, or indeed Neptune, remains Voyage 2's brief 1989 flyby. That means that the only images of Triton's surface are of those that weren't in the shadow on that day. Right now, some 60% of the moon's surface remains unknown to us. Trident was intended to change all of that, engaging in a mapping project that would have unlocked new regions for us to study. 
It would have also attempted to catch images of more plumes to help us further understand what causes these eruptions. Finally, the probe was also intended to investigate the moon's internal structure. If an ocean isn't to blame for the constantly renewing surface, then scientists wanted to find out what is. The price tag for all of this would have been around $500 million, which sounds like a lot until you remember that the James Webb Space Telescope cost $10 billion. And the frontiers a successful Trident mission could have opened up would have been unbelievable. Sadly, we'll never get the chance to see this probe in action. We say sadly because Triton is so far away that a Trident launch in 2025 would have not reached the distant moon until 2038. And now that we've missed that window, there's no way any future mission wouldn't also miss another very important window. The end of summer. Remember oh, when we said how Triton seasons each last 40 Earth years and we've only ever known the southern hemisphere in spring and summer? Well, 2040 will mark the point that winter finally descends, a freezing, long-lasting darkness that would make even Czech winters feel short and bearable. As Triton's south slips into this decades-long night, it will take with it the sight of all of those plumes Voyager 2 saw. Engulfed in darkness, they will become invisible to any visiting spacecraft. The conditions that led to their erupting altered for decades to come. All of which is a roundabout way of saying that if we don't get a probe to Triton by 2040, we'll lose the chance to examine one of its greatest mysteries for at least another four decades. And by turning down Triton, NASA has already missed their chance. We don't want to sound too down about this, for all it sucks that Trident was passed over, we're super pumped for the missions that did get selected. Da Vinci and Veritas are going to reveal Venus in ways we've never imagined, hopefully reigniting interest in our sister planet. And yet, we'd be lying if we said there wasn't a part of us that right now was wishing we could end this video geeking out about an upcoming NASA mission to Triton, to this mysterious world of unexplained geysers, ice volcanoes, and just possibly an alien ocean. Luckily for us, NASA isn't the only game in town. Shortly before we began researching this video, in September 2022, China's space agency unveiled a proposed mission to Neptune. Alongside investigations of the eighth planet, the proposal also calls for flybys of Triton, for an examination of this strange ice world on the edges of our solar system. If China goes ahead, then we can rest easy, knowing that this isn't the end of humanity's story with Triton, that we may yet get the answer to some of its mysteries within our lifetimes. Because if making this video has taught us anything, it's that our solar system is a strange and fascinating place. A place potentially alive with all sorts of secrets we can't wait to learn the answers to. And some of the most spectacular may just be hidden beneath the surface of Triton, waiting for us to discover them.